when they have high blood pressure. You like, you know, for example, from living in poverty. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they're, they're um, rising up when the, all these other social ills become a part of uh, our families who uh, uh, live in poverty. But maybe because they don't set the agenda and they don't get to describe um, what this rising up might mean to begin with, is that uh, we're just doing it from our own perspectives, which is not necessarily a poverty, right? Poverty perspective. If this came um, to me very clearly. I, I was a part of um, a book, uh, I don't know what it was, Resisting the State, it's called. Go get the book. I think Fernwood does that one too. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they looked at uh, different um, uh, people, they would say call activists and whatever you across the country, and I got to be a part of it. And this uh, person that was interviewing me kept talking about, um, um, oh, okay, so when did you start this activism? Like, you're an activist, because I didn't used to use that terminology. And they said, oh, you're an activist, and uh, when did you start this, and when did you do this, and how did you do it? And I didn't think anything of it, but it became part of, I guess, what they call your MO or whatever. And they, I said, well, you may call it activism, but I call it survival. And that kind of became a title. You call it activism, but I call it uh, survival. Mm -hmm. And the author, um, he did a much better job than I would ever have done. He kind of dissected that uh, statement and said, oh my gosh, of course, me and my privilege mm -hmm. have called this activism and uh, whatever, because I'm so privileged. But yeah, you, you were just doing these things because you need to live and survive against anti-racism and all these different issues. It was survival for me. So even in that terminology, it, um, uh, it works that way. Oh, thank you very much. Um, the, um, so I've picked out a few, just a couple of little stories or little things that I've been involved in. And I, said, and I used it from Why Don't the Poor uh, rise up, and one of the things that I thought of immediately was that um, because you don't listen to what the poor have to say, nobody's listening, and nobody's seeing, and nobody's listening. And I'll give you an example. So I'll try to do examples to show you I'm not just pulling these things out of the out of the hat. You don't listen. I'll use because off my fa frame of reference. And uh, is anybody at the union event that just took place a couple of days ago? Oh, Catherine was not that event. Elle was. We're not. No, good, because I'm telling some of the same stories. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't there. <laughs> so um, we don't listen. <coughs> In Halifax, um, uh, many years ago, and I don't suspect that it would be much different today. So I may be older, and I may have been doing this work longer than some of you, but that doesn't mean to say the torch isn't there for you to take and carry, because we might not have gotten it right. The north end of Halifax, um, um, and the same thing happened in the Preston area, we were carrying a very high unemployment rate. This would have been in the early 70s, extremely um, High. Sometimes it was hitting around 70% of community, black community, um, unemployed. So at that time, we had constantly um, were surveying the community. Everybody and everybody's dog was surveying the community. What are your needs? What do you want? Where do you uh, where where you want to go? And what do you want to do? So you can imagine with that kind of unemployment rate, we're, we're talking, I don't know what statistics you were using here, but we're off the charts. <laughs> we're off the charts. So the community kept responding and responding to the, to the um, survey. And guess what um, the number one need consistently came as a part of the survey? what the community wanted. 
you want it? Jobs. Can't get much simpler than that. You, get, you haven't got a job, we want jobs, and then all these other issues that were involved with health, um, sports, whatever, would fall in line, but we want jobs. And then I thought, this is kind of crazy, because the community keeps saying the same thing over and over again. We want meaningful, well-paying of, uh, jobs. But when you look in, I'll give you an, for an example, the black community, there is not, was not one single solitary organization whose responsibility it was to, guess what? <coughs> hmm? To get you jobs? To find jobs. <laughs> 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 Thank you. No organization. No, not one single organization. What year is this? 2017. 27. We're afraid to get the answers wrong. <laughs> <laughs> we know your answers, but I'm afraid. You should be shut up. Today is 2017. Yes. Guess how many black organizations, I'll give an example, uh, I'm going to pick on them for a minute, but I'm going to add to it. Guess how many uh, black organizations have a responsibility to find jobs for black people. Zero. 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 Thank you! <laughs> Give her a round of applause. I was going to say that. <laughs> Absolutely zero. And yet, you could go, as you young people and some of you are older, and go out and do that same survey today. You'd probably say, what does the community want? Let's go do the survey. Spend hundreds and thousands of dollars on the, on the survey. Community's probably going to come back and tell you we want jobs, and still nobody is responsible for actually getting the community jobs. Okay, so I need that one. Remember, that was my first point. We don't listen. We speak a language that the poor of the community doesn't understand. They don't know what language you're speaking. For example, um, I'll give you a little example. I just uh, went to um, a, a conference uh, called ClimateCon, that was in Ottawa, a few, few weeks ago. They asked me to talk about environmental racism, when I was oh, because well, I know about the environment. But yeah, I told them I know a lot. But I didn't go there. And the people were so nice. The, young, the youth were really good. Oh, you're kind of going to talk about that. And they had my little break, and they said, then come and sit down. How much time have I got? Because already I haven't got half a list. And they said, then come join our little circle and have your little tea and think, well, I'm waiting for the speaker and everything. So I thought, oh, isn't that awfully nice of them? So I sat in the circle and sat down. I thought that was really nice that they invited me in. Guess what? I didn't understand how one single <laughs> solitary thing that those young people were talking about. What do I know about climate change? Da -da 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 -da, and what have you in all these different things? I didn't understand it. And they too were concerned about the room. There was like, oh, there must have been at least four or five hundred people at this conference. I could have caught ten of the people of color on one hand. Mm. And I'm like, oh my goodness, and so, but yet, I, f I felt quite confident in myself. <laughs> and I said, well, I can join this conversation, but maybe from a different angle and not using the same language. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I think that the issues that you are raising, I've actually experienced. You have the scientific language and what have you, but I do have the lived experience and I have worked on those issues. I can tell you about the, what is happening in our communities down home in terms of, and I've just been at the, um, the Alton Gas uh, protest, I've been there, and um, I'm working on issues about uh, in, in, uh, incinerators and, and dumps mm -hmm. and all these different issues, uh, part of the Onrich project, um, mm -hmm. uh, fighting issues around um, environmental racism and whatever. So, and I can talk about my own community where we're, we, in, I originally come from Truro, 
the flooding in the poorer black communities and Aboriginal communities that nobody's addressing um, in terms of uh, the losing of homes and, and, and all these issues. I know all about it. I really do. Because I've lived it, I've worked with it, I've agitated for change with it. But yeah, I don't understand. I, I wouldn't have sat in that forum either and been comfortable and helped you on those issues because the poor don't understand what it is that you're talking about and you haven't given us a language that is um, that we speak. Um, the poor don't rise up because we don't help them make the links with how they live and what they experience with um, what uh, what we need to join together to fight and, and gather people. Um, I use that and won't go into detail. I'll use the example of the Goddard Street, Goddard Street occupation that happened here on Goddard Street when we had the longest sit-in in the history of Canada of a federal government office, 133 days. Everybody hear about it by now? Put your hand up if you have. Oh, I thought there'd be a lot more. Wow, that's a story for another day. But nonetheless, right here in your age group and older, we sat in on the Goddard Street Employment Office for 133 days because we lived in the North End where the people were mainly poor, poorest in the city, most marginalized most culturally diverse part of the whole city. Raymond almost divorced me. Shelly <laughs> <laughs> opened the door, helped open the door for the city. That's right. Well, he was so tired of sleeping over there. All the <laughs> but, but why was it successful? And it was successful. We actually won in the sense that the government couldn't take it anymore and came to us and said, okay, okay. We, we'll, we'll, we'll keep it open. I mean, it closed later, but we won that for that immediate person. How did we win? We won because we had spent time making connections with each other and communities. We didn't just sit in one day and say, okay, we're going to sit in for 133 days. Come on, you guys, let's go. No, before that, I can remember we had, for example, what we called at that time, a rent a demo team. And we, 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 we challenged everything in this city. There were, it didn't matter if it was racism, it didn't matter if it was leaving services or whatever. The arts community, they were cutting back in the arts in those days. All those different communities, then because we helped each other in terms of their, their um, organizing and, and fight backs. So when we went to do the occupation, we all were involved and we all had a stake in that office and wanted that office to remain open. So we haven't helped each other. We haven't figured out how to form the links. Um, the next one I put, um, because we use, um, oh, I want to do something on the language too, because. Jackie was really good on the issue of the capitalism and what have you. Well, when I was organizing from a young age, do you think I knew what capitalism was? <laughs> Socialism, Marxism, all these Jesuit isms? I didn't have a clue. I was just doing the work. But yet, when I got in the, in the academic forum, I found that I better go back and uh, we had that in school, but I didn't pay any attention to it. <laughs> I better go back and study this stuff and figure out what, which one of these things I'm supposed to be a socialist. <laughs> I don't know. And I'm, I'm still learning because um, I think it was Solidarity Halifax just had an event at the North Branch Library not too long ago. Anybody in this room anarchists? Anybody here? Who, Scared of Cusilo? I never had a clue what you people do. <laughs> Honestly, so I purposely sat in on that workshop. I heard the terminology, and then when I went in the workshop, they were saying, we can't mobilize the communities. We don't know how to, to do what it is that we're doing. I was sitting in on it, and I was saying, 
Well, to begin with, you better start telling people what, who these who you are. <laughs> if I heard, I was afraid of you. <laughs> so once I got in that little workshop, I saw, thought, you okay? You're not bad at all. I think, <laughs> I think we could work together because it was a housing project um, in the north end of Halifax, um, uh, a housing area on in, right by the bridge there, and. People were are being gentrified. Say that word. Gentrified. Gentrified. So where the people that have been long-standing in the community are being pushed out, they think they're still living in the cooperative, and it's no longer cooperative. A lot of people don't even realize it. So I'm saying to the um, anarchists, oh, good. Like you know, if you guys want to, <laughs> we could have to find, figure out um, how to get into the community because community's upset when they can't, when they're losing their houses. You guys can then hold your protests and what have you, and knock down the doors and do whatever with the city if you work in a team, and we could we could clear up, we could do something here, right? So it's making those links. When it comes to poverty, we don't think about how to uh, make the links. One minute? Okay. Um, uh, when you do stand up, don't expect there's not going to be a backlash. Why would, why would the poor uh, rise up when, uh, and I think somebody on the panel mentioned it, when, when you do something and you're going to get attacked? Our sister Al Jones here, mm -hmm. just this uh, week, I just heard about it. We should never allow somebody like her to be called out. No, there's no way. We should have an organized fight back back campaign that immediately goes into play, and then she doesn't mind standing up for the poor. I'll be on that. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. 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 then. Five of us. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. Well, the whole book, we have a revolution right here, I'm telling you. <laughs> There's, um, in the backlash of half a minute? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> On the backlash um, issue, I always mention the case of Sandra Bess. Uh, Sandra Bess was a school teacher, a black school teacher. In, um, in uh, Halifax Darkness. She mostly worked on the darker side in the Preston area. We're having a terrible time with black uh, students being kicked out of the school system. I'll make a long story short. So a uh, teacher and principals after principals kept kicking out these black kids. Sandra Bess, the one Sandra Bess was a principal in the nurse school water and is principal at the new mixed school between black and white. Sandra Bess did everything that we asked of black teachers in the sense that she made a commitment from the beginning. No kid, no kid is getting kicked out of this school. If there's, uh, if there's uh, problems, we, she had round tables, she hired um, support teachers and workers and what have you to work through the issue. Guess what happened to Sandra Betts? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Sandra Betts got pulled out of that system so, fa so fast mm -hmm. because white teachers didn't want those black kids to stay in the school. Sandra Best ended up being sent out to the boonies, not that anybody's from Fall River, but the same <laughs> <laughs> Sandra Best never survived. Sandra Best was never the same. But who rallied for Sandra Best? And that's why I call it the Sandra, the Sandra Best case. San Sandra Best, as far as I'm concerned, was uh, left out to dry. Um, I'm gonna stop there. Um, because it, we could go on and on and on in terms of why the, and use a million examples. I thank you. I don't think I overdid the time. <laughs> speak really loud, so people might have to move up. I've lost my voice. <laughs> so if people, are, this is like as much as I can do. So if you're in the back, you're not going to be able to hear the message. Um, so it's not working. No mic? How far back can you hear me? This is the last one. Oh, you can hear me. Okay. I'll just sound gross. <laughs> <laughs> no, Frank's still like this. 
So about two weeks ago, I was in Nova Institute, which is a women's prison. And I, I'll tell you for, in a minute why I was in the visiting area instead of up on the ranges. But I was in the visiting area, which is where they wanted to make me do a poetry program under the cameras. So obviously no women are going to come. And um, one of the women is mopping the floor. So I'm feeling really bad that this woman is mopping and I'm sitting there. So I keep you know, saying, like, I can move. I'm moving my feet. Can I help? I feel bad I'm sitting there. And she looks at me and she says, oh, no, I'm just paying my debt to society. And like rolls her eyes, right? Um, can, is it on? Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, yeah. and then one of the guards walks by, and to his face, she's all like, oh, hi, you know, how's it going? Can you take my job? And the minute he walks through the door, she's like, I hope you put some balls on this wet floor. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm saying is that uh, I was, and I was loving it. I couldn't post anything about it because, you know, it's just not the kind of thing you have to carry out, but um, that was subversive resistance, right? Um, clearly, this regime that was imposed upon her of prison that, you know, you go and you mop floors and then you become a better person and not criminal. Um, she was obviously having none of that and expressed it to me in all these particular ways, which is exactly why I was sitting in the visiting area in the first place, because um, another form of resistance that the women inside the prison have is simple affection. Um, so because the woman, and Ardeth can speak to this, which is why Ardeth is no longer allowed into the prison either, so, um, you know, you go speak to the woman, and uh, if you have affection and they have affection for you, this is seen as some kind of illegitimate uh, behavior. So either you are, I don't know, like queer and subverting things, or just that you are somehow maybe offering them drugs or something. There's all these... Um, speculations about why you might be affectionate with a woman, they might be affectionate with you, mostly because a lot of the women are written off as, um, you know, the, the troublesome woman. So these are the women inside the secure unit, like the max unit, and so the women that they see as, as uh, aggressive, non-human, sociopathic, and all these things. So when they express love, they assume that this is only coming from these illegitimate places. And so as a result, um, they said I couldn't go onto the ranges anymore, and I had to sit in front of the guards under the cameras and do poetry. So my point is not about me. My point is that um, we need to recognize in, within the conditions of oppression what resistance looks like. And it can be as simple as expressing love to somebody. It can be as simple as coming in and you know smiling at somebody who's there to do a program. And I've had women come in and like brush, like sweep the floor when I'm in a room because they're like, if it was my house um, and you were my guests, I would want it to be clean. So of course I would clean it for you now. I've had women give me like Twizzlers out of their packets on canteen day and I'm like, I can leave here and go buy Twizzlers. And they're like, no, I want you to have some of my candy. We know you like candy. Uh, women have drawn me like pictures of animals with belly buttons or whatever because, you know. Um, and these are exactly the reasons why an artist, again, has completely experienced this, why when these things happen, you will be pushed out and not allowed to go. So we have to recognize the very, very intimate ways that structural oppression occurs on is not simply physical violence. Of course, when we're talking about women in prison, they're already in a completely oppressive state. They're literally deprived of their freedom. They are subject to violence, many of them. <clears throat> when I'm on the maximum unit, many of them are there because they've engaged in some form of resistance. Um, they've been pepper sprayed in the face or something. You know, They're usually having some kind of uh, mental episode <clears throat> due to trauma. And then when they react, you know, they will be attacked and put onto the secure range. And then I'll come in in that, and these women will find within that uh, the capacity to write, or the capacity to tell you about what's happening, or the capacity to wonder about your life and ask you about those things. So that is all resistance, and that is all rising up. <clears throat> and I want to give credit to that. I think perhaps the question I'd like to ask is not, why do the poor not rise up? But what do we learn from people living in ex experiences of extreme oppression? that we can then take in order to support the work that needs to be done, those of us with the privilege and the resources. I can't tell you how many black women allegedly work for me right now. Like, I have so many landlords. <laughs> like, because now, like, when, when women know a woman who can speak on the phone and sound, like, professional and articulate, you, they need that, that's something simple. And I have so many women that are like, can you, like, pretend to be my former landlord? And I'm like, sure. <laughs> can you say that I work for you? Sure. You know, you do, here, like do something for me and now you work for me and I'm on your employer. So, uh, I don't know, the mountain knows this, but so many black women are apparently working with the Nazis chair right now. <laughs> so, because that can like help you get a reference or get something. And it's not that I don't work with these women because they work with me all the time because they share their knowledge and they facilitate communication all these ways. They teach me so many things. 
Um, so they are working for me. But I'm lucky to be in a position now where I can get on the phone and say, oh, you know, this is an nice teacher of women's studies calling, I'm giving a reference, and it's going to work. That's a small way that we are resisting all the time through the relationships we build with each other in the community. I was in a meeting with a woman yesterday who'd been fired from her job because she had been charged because they were trying to get her son. He had gone on the run, so they charged her, a black woman, um, basically hoping that therefore he would then you know, come back. So as a result, she lost her job because they had, she had these illegitimate criminal charges. They do this stuff all the time. She ended up evicted from her home. And then when they dropped the charges, she's trying to get her job back. Hell yeah, I'm like, work for the Criminal Justice Association. I was in that meeting dropping off the handle work for any of those people. It doesn't matter. Um, and there's this very like middle class idea that, oh, you know, you're a good professional name. Like you have to, and we know that these women, we do work to them and relate to them. So why can't we go and use our privilege to make sure that that woman in that meeting is not going to be screwed over by this like gross school board rep that's sitting there talking to her like, oh, well, we just didn't hear communication from you. I'm like I can validate that communication, you know, like um, I was on her email, you know, like because it's ridiculous. So my point is that we often think, and this has been addressed already, that we think of resistance or revolution as these very steps very far ahead of us, um, but they actually take place in, in, in these building blocks. So we, like well, what position can you use that you have to help the uh, impoverished or oppressed people in your life get one more step to where they need to be. Um, speaking of prisons again, I'm just going all over the place because I'm sick, so I don't know. <laughs> um, there was a man, a young man, that, uh, a young African Nova Scotia man, and his mother died, and we had to get him out to go to the funeral. <clears throat> so they're not supposed to bring them to the funerals in oranges. They're supposed to, like, in the, where they're supposed to give them their clothes. But the sheriffs didn't do that, so he came wearing. Um, his orange like prison clothes um, and he didn't want to go so the morning of he called his aunt and he said I'm not gonna come it's really like embarrassing and traumatic for everybody if I come wearing these clothes and everybody sort of talked him into it and we were like it's the black community like ain't nobody gonna be shook not because we're more criminal but because obviously we experience the structural violence on a daily basis so there's nobody at a funeral that's gonna be shocked that somebody had to come from prison that's a reality it doesn't mean all of us are incarcerated but we are disproportionately incarcerated. Um, so he came to the funeral, and immediately when he came into the church, um, people started greeting him. So they stand with the sheriffs, and they're not supposed to touch anybody. The sheriffs are not supposed to let you do that. They're supposed to kind of hold you in the back. Um, but the, the priest, the, the preacher, the minister, you know, came up, and he welcomed him to the church, and everybody started clapping and welcoming him. Um, and people started shouting out, I love you, we love you, welcome home. So this is the church in Cherrybrook. Um, so it's very crowded, small community church. Um, and then he, he picked up the microphone and he spoke on behalf of his family. He's the oldest son. And when he did that, the entire church um, stood up and basically embraced him within the church. Um, and the love that was in that room was so powerful that they couldn't stop anything that happened after that. Uh, the sheriff let him hold his baby for the first time. He had a baby daughter he had never held. And he let everybody come up and embrace him and kiss him because the force in that room was so much the sheriffs just knew that they had to go with it. And so they were moved to really, as much as they could, permit this love to take place. You were there, I believe, at this funeral, so you can speak to this. And I said, yes, I said at the time that this is what community resistance looks like. You don't have, going back to what Lynn said, you don't have to have the vocabulary of academic prison abolition and, you know, you've read 800 books on the prison industrial complex because the prison, the, the people in the community knew that, that through their love and welcoming the son home and refusing to shame him and refusing to criminalize him and refusing to look at him as scans and, you know, going in that church and sp spilling that love over to him, they knew that that was resistance and they didn't have the power to do anything else. None of us could break him out of chains. You know, we can't fight the prison industrial complex right now. We can't drive tanks into their walls, but that was powerful and it taught people in that community a lot and not in ways that people in that community needed to be taught about, but people in themselves could see that situation. They understood what oppression was in that situation. They understood exactly the way that they were going to show resistance, and it didn't have to be violent resistance. It was love in that community for a son of the community. It was the most beautiful and powerful thing. I posted about it, and then the guards were all mad at me. They were like, why is she saying this about us? And he's like, no, it's not even mean. Like, they're like, we talked to her and she seemed nice. And they were like, <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, she was like, why is she saying these things about the prison system? Um, and then he had to explain to them, like, she's not against the sheriff. She's, she likes, you know, she was fine with them. She's talking about the system. So then he had, like, these conversations about decarceration with, like, the prison staff, which was a really interesting aftermath. Um, so 
my point is that um, everything that I've learned about how to be in a community or be in relation with people or to you know do prison work, whatever you want to call it, um, has been directly learned from those in those positions who have taken the resources they have and granted them to me, uh, trusting me to take those forward for them. Um, Lynn was speaking about Frank Magazine, like the dude, the guys were calling me today and they're like, we saw you on the news, you know, they love it. Like, they don't give an F what people are like saying why I'm on the news, they just like seeing me on the news, you know. And then, and then they feel really empowered that I was on the news and I'm like, but I was a monkey. And they're like, it's so, it doesn't matter, you're on the news and you worked on like, keep going. You know, and like a lot of these guys are like rural white community guys too, they're not all black guys and they're still like excited by this whole process, right? I said, next time I'm gonna shout you out, I'm gonna be like, Call it to the guys out of Northeast. <laughs> well, on TBC or something. Um, but that the point is that that's like a very serious support um, that they feel when that face comes on that they know and that they've trusted me with their stories and and that they they see me bring it for them. They they want to give me power too, and they give me all the power that they have in all the ways that they have. They can't get out, but they call me and they make sure, and they'll be bargaining those phone calls. Sometimes it's a person who's like, I'm not on their account. So they probably sold something to get on the phone with me to be like, yo, you were on the news, I saw you, I just wanted to say what's up, you know? Um, and so that is, like often we sort of think, okay, we're the middle class people or the academic people, whatever, and then we go in to save people. It's the opposite relationship. They give everything to us, but the thing that they trust us with is that we have the privilege and we have to do everything. We are bound to do what we can, whether that's pretend to be somebody's landlord or you know, like make sure that you're saying you work for somebody or just taking that power and, and relentlessly using it. Um, that's there. So what I'm saying is they have risen, you know, and it's us to carry it forward. Um, I'll just do, I'm gonna do a poem and then I'm gonna stop talking. Um, this poem came from, and this is going back to what Catherine Martin was talking about when she raised the article, uh, the article that just came on CBC, talking about um, the high incarceration rates of women. Uh, Kim Pate has written about this extensively, that the cuts to social services for women have resulted <coughs> completely in, in rising incarceration. This is a global phenomenon as well. Um, and we're not you know, treating women's trauma, we're just like putting women in prison. So you see these incredible high rates for women with mental illnesses or disabilities. Um, so the woman allowed me to write this poem. Um, I wrote it for a sexual assault event, but it's relevant here. Um, this poem is triggering, so I will give you a warning. Um, and I, I say this poem with the pre-introduction that this poem is talking about the really terrible things that happen to poor women. But I want you to remember that these are also the women that from the max unit where they're behind bars give up their canteen. You know, the women that like hug you in front of the guards when they're not supposed to. So this is certainly not a poem to reduce them to what they've seen as in their records. It's to bring their stories to you to understand the conditions of oppression that people are living with. But I also want you to have the image of these beautiful, wonderful, caring women um, that you know will do everything they can to always help and, and support other women that come in to their space. So first he took her body and he didn't ask to touch. And now they take her body and they lock it into cuffs. They say they have her on the camera with goods worth 50 bucks. There's laws to follow in this country. It's no excuse if life is rough. They say they caught her on parole with trace amounts of drugs. They say that looking at her record, the case is open and shut. She never even had the words to say what he had done. But now she's the one with sentences being given by a judge. And half the time, nobody ever told her he was wrong. She's always being betrayed by every man she trusts. He says jail's easier for women, so just say that it's her bust. He says he loves her, so she takes the charges for her man. Her lawyer told her deal, and she didn't understand. And they drag up all her past when they get her on the stand. They say she's unreliable, just check the tattoos on her hand. The crowd says they won't charge her if she just tells on the gang. Now it's going around the neighborhood, they heard that she's a rat, but police just turn their back, because she's indigenous or black. These men take what they want and then they throw her out like trash and they all say that she's worthless if she can't be flipped for cash. The workers take her baby because they say that she can't bond. We know that wouldn't happen if she was middle class and blonde, but somehow they never showed when she was calling 911 and the day that she goes missing, nobody will respond. The headline says she was an addict and she was well known to the cops. 
And the picture they use on the news is her latest mugshot. She's doing time on charges that never were her own. Her abusive boyfriend uses her apartment to hide the gun. She was the driver for the robbery. We all know that he done. And now she writes him letters from her cell. They go unanswered, everyone. It's not like poor black women smuggle drugs for fun. For men who send 10 women through the airport and then go on the run. Men threatened and assaulted her till she swallowed those condoms. Now she's locked in federal prison while traffickers import tons. She just wants to feed her children. Now they tell her they'll be gone. Men exploit her body from the time that she is born. Her mother turns the other way to keep him safe and warm. He'll only do a year or two if ever he gets caught while they've locked her down in seg when they accused her of assault. She's having flashbacks when they strip search her like rubbing wounds with salt. And now her body's being exploited one more time up in the courts. They tell her pay the victim surcharge, but she can because she's poor, so she makes money on the streets on the corner where she's forced. The cop took a so-called freebie, but of course she can't report. And then the undercover breaches her when she goes to make a score. They say that they'll convict her of committing welfare fraud, and now they're piling up the charges on her criminal record. When she said he never raped her, they charge her with a false report. They make her do the time. Then they start proceedings to deport. She lived her whole life here in foster care, but no one ever thought to get her citizenship, so they never sent the forms. They chained her to her bed in the hospital ward. They punish her for having children. Why can't she just abort? She'll only raise another generation for the taxpayer to support. And she's not the ideal victim, so I guess it's all her fault. She's the 90% of victims doing time behind our walls. But when we talk about justice for survivors, we don't mean her at all. So I'm going to be really fast, because I think we're running a little bit over time. Okay. Um, just yell at me from the back if I'm mumbling. I tend to mumble. Um, I just want to talk about a couple things really fast. And uh, one, I feel like we are really letting our movements off the hook. So I want to talk a little bit about activist neoliberalism. And I'm going to pick up on a little bit about what Jackie said. Uh, I really agree with you, but I just want to push you on one or two points. I hope that's OK. Um, so in the early 2000s, there was a real push for the expansion of reproductive health and contraception for women living in the developing world. USAID funded particular NGOs in Peru at the time. So there's a civil war happening in Peru, and it's largely happening between you know, colonial, lighter-skinned folks living in cities and the indigenous insurgency living outside of the cities. So it had been going on for a long time. Simultaneously, what happens is that USAID funds a bunch of NGOs to deliver contraception, which of course is the goal of so many feminist activist movements in the developed world to have freedom and choice, right? Freedom and reproductive choice. But what happens is over 300,000 indigenous women became permanently sterilized, many of them coercively. And so I think we need to think about case studies like this when, you know, it's very easy to blame neoliberalism for individualism and say that, you know, capitalism is teaching us that individualism is the only way to be, but we are also capitalism, right? So the architectures of our economy are the architectures of ourselves. Um, and I think also when it comes to thinking about mental health, that's my particular area of interest. So when I think about poverty, I think about things like um, our emotional well-being, our bodies, the integrity of our bodies, our ability to be resilient when we experience trauma. But the ways in which, say, for example, the deinstitutionalization movement is positioned also lets us off the hook. So flashback, we go to the 1960s. We know that around the mid-1950s, the highest number in history in North America of people were incarcerated in either prisons or mental health institutions. We know conditions are dire. They are terrible. They are dehumanizing. They are violent, terrible places. So of course, we are right to protest them, right? So we are great to quote Irving Goffman as scholars. We are great, all the white grad students walking around quoting Michel Foucault. You know, we are, we are doing our service as leftists, intellectual leftists in the 70s and 80s in supporting all of these institutions for the quote unquote insane to be shut down, right? Because that's justice, that's freedom, that's autonomy. But the thing that we also asked for that should have been there was community care. And that didn't happen. And I think the thing that often kills us is that we find traction in our wins where our language as activists 
coincides with the language of capitalism. And when I think about health and when I think about mental health or sexual health, too often that's been the case. So when I think about why the poor don't rise up, I think about, well, who are poor? They're our most vulnerable. They're usually our most highly depressed. They are experiencing high rates of misery. And yes, some of that misery comes from our brains. Some of it is socially created. But when, as activists, our only response to the widespread epidemic of depression, anxiety, self-harm is to say, well, it's created by capitalism, we're not doing much to help, say, for example, in a situation where Elle calls me at 11 o'clock at night and says, I have someone here who's suffering a psychotic break. So there's a family here. There's someone who is smashing mirrors, threatening to hurt people in the house. They're not in touch with reality. We can't call the cops because they're going to get deported. Yeah. Our movements aren't doing anything for them. And I think that if we tackle the problem of emotional literacy, and if we tackle the problem of saying, OK, good. Capitalism harms us emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, but we just stay there a minute. And we start asking the questions of how. How does that happen? How does that happen in the micro moments? I think that building emotional literacy can help us get to the point where we have the energy and capacity to rise up. Because when so many of the folks I know are self-harming and can't get out of bed in the morning, they certainly cannot organize. We just can't organize together when we're living in these conditions. We are depressed, we are anxious, we are lonely, we are alienated. And then the only media given to us at our disposal is, and I'm so happy that we talked about this already today, is we're given capitalist media, right? We're given Netflix. We're given storylines and TV shows that ultimately serve the structures of empire within us, right? Which become a distraction from the amount of pain that we're in. But I don't think it's all negative. I think that there are movements out there that are really trying to build emotional literacy and building kinship. Because one of the effects of austerity is that we know we're without a social safety net. Mm -hmm. But not just in terms of community-based services, in kinship networks, right? It's an effect of individualism. So I want to talk about this super cool Halifax-based project that I hope will spread itself around like a lovely love virus infecting everybody. And that's the Starfish Project. And there are folks in this room who have been working together to develop kinship as a radical act to intervene in alienation, to build loving, trusting, chosen family, community relationships as a way to contain some of the distress, as a way to hold space for each other to try and get ourselves to the point where we have the capacity to organize together. That's it. Good. Uh, I'll try to be relatively fast too. Uh, I suspect I'm going to probably piss some people off. Someone generously offered that I should be used to that by now, uh, which actually was really helpful. Uh, I, I'm kind of going to be reading off a page, but I am nervous as heck to be alongside all these amazing thinkers and doers on this panel. Um, I'm going to put forward three theses for discussion. They're pretty big, but I hope in conversation we're able to bring them back to concrete organizing pretty easily. They are, um, and so this has been covered, one, the poor do rise up. Uh, yes. Two, those sections of the left with the greatest access to resources are practically, if not theoretically, opposed to the poor rising up. And three, uh, the left must either transform itself or be replaced. I recognize that a lot of that's about the left, not about the poor, but I think I, I did that because that's probably who's in this room today, realistically. We're on a university campus. Um, so one, the poor do rise up. Um, I mean, in the obvious sense, which has been covered, um, the last few years have witnessed many oppositional pop uh, popular movements of the poor, including Black Lives Matter, uh, last year's wave of prison strikes across the United States, uh, indigenous resistance that you know periodically breaks forcefully into mainstream discourse, as it did with I don't know more, um, yeah, resistance at Muskrat Falls, etc. Um, there's also, this is true in a less spectacular sense, and I think Al spoke to this really well, the poor also engage in more or less coordinated oppositional social practices as a matter of course. Uh, this you know, varies from workplace theft and sabotage, uh, unpermitted art of the sort that gets denigrated as vandalism, um, and aggressively advancing demands in a host of ways, um, but also equally or more important are the forms of mutual aid and community-based care and justice. Um, and so on that are endemic. Uh, that these forms of resistance are neglected in discussion of uprising reflects an implicitly Eurocentric and fundamentally liberal paradigm that imagines only certain sort of capital P political activity is, uh, is legitimate. 
Um, which brings me to two, the controversial one. Uh, those sections of the left with the greatest access to resources are uh, practically, if not theoretically, uh, though in my opinion often both, <laughs> uh, are opposed to the poor rising up. Uh, in this, I would include NGOs, nonprofits, uh, the big brand formula unions, and the new Democratic Party. Uh, at this juncture, a, demo, a disclaimer might be necessary. Um, I'm not attacking the individuals, uh, for the most part, who might be part of or engaged with these institutions. I'm questioning their structural role within Canadian capitalism. Uh, similarly, I'm not opposed to reforms which make immediate improvements in people's lives. Um, I think you'd have to be heartless for that, and I hope I'm not. <laughs> um, but reforms can be won in different ways. Um, I'd like to contrast, uh, for an example, uh, challenges to police participation in Pride in Toronto and Halifax, for an example. Uh, in Toronto, disruptive mobilization by queer Black Lives Matter organizers really pushed forward discourse around institutionalized police racism. Uh, it challenged the sort of bourgeoisified queer popular culture, and it provided an inspiring example of the power of grassroots organizing. Uh, in Halifax, uh, NGOs met with the police and negotiated their stepping back from pride. And that's great. That's certainly a good thing. I, I am not in any way denying that that's good. However, um, there, there's trade-offs, especially in light of um, the Halifax Regional Police's sort of well-documented anti-blackness. Um, and that trade-off is that the police were able to come forward and win a public relations victory with this. They are able to say, look how progressive and racially sensitive we are, um, and those who who won this from them were forced uh, to kind of uh, laud their progressiveness. Um, you know, Chief, I don't know, I don't know if Chief Blay is delusional or dishonest, but <laughs> let's be real. Um, this sort of compromise isn't due to bad boards or some sort of individual liberal politics. Um, rather, for most NGOs, as necessities of legality and of a, and or marketplace survival, uh, this sort of thing is their only way to make change. They don't have, there's not a better way to do it uh, within that paradigm. Um, so the fact is they just can't be vehicles for the poor to rise up. Um, some foreign reforms too have been won by the historic uh, labor movement. Unfortunately, the contemporary mainstream labor movement has wholeheartedly bought into a legalistic regime of no strike clauses and the right to manage. In the big steel sea unions, we have border guards, but not temporary foreign workers, let alone workers without status. We have prison guards, but not prisoners. We have police, but not the unemployed. Um, the anti-pornism in that should be really obvious, I think. <laughs> um, at the best moments, rank and file overcome union structures and defy the law. Uh, unfortunately, more often, as we've seen in Nova Scotia with instances of back-to-work legislation, unions order insurgent workers back to work and then go on to sheepdog for the NDP. Um, I do hope in discussion we're able to talk a bit about solidarity unionism and other models of worker organizing that get outside that, but come back to that. Digression aside, the New Democratic Party, <laughs> um, who were finally honest enough to remove the word socialism from their constitution. Um, I'll keep this very brief. The NDP rarely mobilizes poor people uh, even to vote, let alone to take collective action. It does absorb significant time, effort, and resources of the left only to act in power exactly how it says it will act, which is as the party of a kinder, gentler neoliberalism. Um, so, this brings me to my last point. The left must either transform itself or be replaced. Uh, to begin, I don't think the left, which I expect includes most people in this room, uh, is necessary or in any way decisive in whether or not the poor rise up. Um, this ties back to my first point. Leadership emerges from communities in struggle independently of the left. Uh, so that, that's kind of what I mean by replaced. Uh, but I don't think the left is worthless. I, I do think we have skills, experience, perspectives, and, and resources <laughs> that are valuable if they can be put in the service of struggle. Um, I've often been fascinated with one part of the sort of Zapatista, the Zapatista's origin story, and Dr. Kostavich has written about this um, and could probably say a lot more. I'm going to butcher it. The very short version uh, involves a group of Maoists, uh, many of whom were middle class, leaving northern Mexico. Um, and heading to Chiapas with plans to set up their sort of like Maoist base area. Um, what happened though is, is they were transformed. What emerged from the Lacandon jungle a decade later wasn't this Marxist Leninist party, um, but was something completely new and different and, and very particular. Um, so unfortunately, I think many of us on the left are stuck kind of at this, this first stage where we have our organizations and ideas, and we think we're Prometheus or something. <laughs> um, 
I think we need to move out of the spaces we're in. That's like professional positions, NGOs, unions, the NDP, and for that matter, universities. Um, and we need to throw ourselves into struggles in ways that transform our ideas and approaches. Um, if we want to offer anything to revolution, we need to stop saying one thing and doing another. Uh, for better or worse, revolution will happen with or without us. Thanks. Ah. Uh, folks, thanks, thanks so much to our panelists once again for uh, truly like a, an amazing set of, of comments and so diverse and such rich reflection on um, lifetimes of organizing and engagement. Um, really just so rich to listen to and I hope you folks got out of, out of it as much as I did. I'm sure you did. Um, we are we are late, as is as anybody who knows me in this room. That is like my state of being. <laughs> so I, I I hate to cut this off without any discussion, but I I am going to ask that we keep it very short. We are technically supposed to be done already, um, but uh, I but think. But it's not the Halifax Library. No, it's not the library, <laughs> who, who I truly am stretch. afraid of. <laughs> no, we can stretch this time. So, so, uh, I have the Nancy's chair here. <laughs> so, I think we can take we can take 15 minutes for questions and then uh, and then wrap it up uh, just before at about 10 to 9. Give folks a chance to run for the hills before security comes and chases us out. Uh, so, I'm going to ask you uh, just to raise your hands. I will come to you um, with the mic. Hello everybody. I think a few of you people know who I am and a few of you don't. I don't really got a question, but I got more of a comment. I'm really confused. I'm 100% confused right now. I'm looking at the panel, I'm looking at the people in the audience, and I want to, everyone to raise their hand that's been into a federal penitentiary. Who's been there more than say three or four times? Yeah. And who else is in the audience that's on welfare? Put your hand up. Oh, he doesn't, he doesn't mean to visit. Okay, wow, there's only a couple, so I'm really confused by why I'm standing here. Because I'm a single father, I've been on the news, I've fought the system for four years. A lot of different things I own to get my little girl, which is right here. I'm on welfare, I gotta save up to be poor. You know, and I wrote a book, I, I've been on a panel discussion about prisons and stuff. And I'm sitting here listening to this, and I'm looking and looking, and I said, you know what, I bet you that I can count in my hand, if that, how many people have actually been locked in a hole for 45 days, shitting in a little hole, that have been abused in Dorchester Penitentiary in the early 80s. I think I might be the only one. You know, and they talk about the cycle of poverty. My little girl hopefully will not be the third generation on welfare. I'll do whatever it takes to do it. And I'm listening to all these panels, I'm listening to all this stuff, and I'm 100 million percent not racist at all, right? I believe in love and I believe in the human beings, I mean, in humanity, right? So it's not really a question, though. I just get confused when I come to these meetings and stuff, and I don't see anybody with any experience, or never lived it, or never had a, you know, watch a man run down home with guts in his stomach, a knife sticking out of his neck, witnessing all this that puts people that I have to take a pipe and bust somebody's head open before they would have sex with me, right? People that don't really understand exactly what happens in our prisons, right? And, and in living off welfare, we came on a bus, she's going to be late going home from school, but I had to be here because I thought this was about people like me, right? You know, I don't want my little girl. I lost everything I own. I sacrificed everything from a two-bedroom one to run one bedroom. I go see my social worker again. They want to take more money. Now I got to get a bachelor apartment for me and my child. Right? I can't come here to go to university. I can't send her to university. I'm 51 years old. I don't have a dime. I'm not allowed to have a dime. It's over my budget. But you know what? I love that little girl. And I'll do whatever it takes to make sure that little girl doesn't live the same life that I had and her grandmother had. She was a biker woman. She hanged out with Ducky Brooks, a very well-known native woman in Nova Scotia and other stuff, okay? You know, my third generation here, I'm going to stop it. And it takes people like us or other people that are actually listening to make this happen. 
I post it and took a lot of people off my Facebook and I post the videos and people go on Georgie Fagan, and you'll see us on the news. You'll see the video I just posted about being arrested, uh, accused of cocaine, firearms, and drugs on April 20th of this year. They took my child away from me. They threatened to take my child if I didn't sign the complaint from the cops that wrongfully dead, dumped my dead girl's ashes on the floor, the one that I lost last year. They said, Mr. Fagan, if you don't take this complaint away from the Halifax police, we will take your other daughter. I committed no crime because I have four federal bits plus, because I have over 100 convictions, because I've been in almost every prison across Canada, because I'm Georgie Fagan, ex-biker, and always will be an outlaw biker or whatever. That's just in my blood, because I believe in freedom and believe in choices that we don't have to be forced to make from the government and from laws. So when I walk in here and I start listening for an hour and I'm looking around again, thank you for being here. Because you're here for me. Right? And you're here for my daughter. Thank you. You're here for me. And you're here for my daughter. Right? Because that's the first thing I gotta that people need to understand. Experience and knowledge comes from those who experienced it and have the knowledge. Right? You know, no disrespect to anybody in this room, then. But if you never we can go to the old saying that we all hear. If you never walk the mile in somebody's shoes, don't go near his shoes. Right? Don't even touch them. Because you have no right to. If we're going to be loving each other and cherish each other and respect each other, well, let's start doing it. Because action speaks louder than words. I don't listen here. I listen here. Right? I'm sorry if I get a little bit much ago, but I think this is the only way for people to actually listen. Is get a little bit aggressive in, in what people say because apparently nobody's getting it because my mother was on welfare. The system has not changed in over 40 years that I know of and the system's not broken. The system's corrupt. So let's get that straight right from the beginning. It's corrupt right from law enforcement, social services, the government, the whole nine yards. If you think it's broken, good luck with that one. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry I didn't have a question but I just get a little bit because I was kind of confused why I was here. I just want to say thank you for coming, Georgie. Thanks for being here. And thanks for your words, too. Other, other comments or questions? I'm going to ask you and just gently remind you to keep it short. Alright, um, thank you because you, you spoke what I've been feeling the whole time here. So I have a lot of respect and love for everybody up there. Um, I didn't understand a lot like what you said, Lynn. I didn't understand some of the words that people were saying and I've been an activist, so they say, for many years in the city and around the world, whatever. But they did the same thing, called me an activist. I was like, what? I thought they were just crazy people, whatever. And then I actually thought that as my derby being an activist. So whatever, it is what it is. But um, I really appreciate what he had to say because I agree 100% and I listen to everything everybody said, left, right, back, I mean, those, those are just what you use your hands, you know what I mean? That, that's what that means to me. And like, for me, like I lived in different, you know, walked and lived in different hoods all over this, you know, whatever. So I grew up a lot different, you know, in an abusive place for many, many years, dealt with the police. So yeah, I didn't, I didn't do the jail time, but I, you know, know, like I know many people so much so that I drive by and do healing on the outside of the jails and prisons and things like that. So I think, I think to, uh, sorry, I'm trying to be quick. Um, I think understanding is important and that's what I think he's getting at is understanding is very, very important and a lot of us don't have that. You have to have that life experience and that knowledge and then you get that wisdom, right? You got to really get that understanding and when you're talking like um, uh, there's between the bridges, I don't know if you guys know about that. They're trying to like put money towards different communities, whatever, they're starting with the North and the Dark, but Darkness, I was on crashing those meetings, I tend to do that and um, not in a bad way, I put love and light and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I've been out at the river protecting the water, stop out and gas. We all need water to live, just saying, for like four months out there at the front gate, Alton gas. Um, but anyways, went to these meetings and they held it in Dartmouth. They started it there. They wanted the project to go there. They, you know, what does the community need? That kind of thing. 
And uh, then they realized a lot of people from like what they call the Bean, where I lived, you know, um, didn't show up to these meetings. So they were like, well, what's going on? We'll put up a new one. So they put up a new one, no, nobody showed up. And they're like, well, I don't understand. Like, why, why won't they show up and say what? It's like, if you don't know what's wrong with the community or what they need in the community, that's exactly the reason why they're not here. Because there's a huge disconnect. They didn't like that. They didn't like what I had to say. Um, they told me that the meeting, because I don't live in the Bean, so actually Aunt Feeney turned around and high-fived me and said, oh, yes, she does. She's from here, so <coughs> she's from the Bean. So they had to kind of be quiet because um, they were all the government. Sorry, I'm, I, I get really, like, 